Hello, uh, Ann Oldhaus, a, a professor of law at the University of Wisconsin <laughs> Law School and a frequent guest on the Glenn Show in the past, but not recently, and a woman who blogs uh, about matters political and uh, legal and gender-related and uh, other things, and here we are in the middle of a campaign season, so we're doing Blogging Heads, Ann. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Glenn Lowry. This is the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. So, Ann... Um, why don't you set us up, and you know, we were just talking about this before we went on uh, the record, uh, about uh, all these different gender themes that are cutting through our politics these days. You want to like review that and, and get us started here? Okay. Well, it is a very weird campaign season. We have our expected candidate, Hillary, who's a person we've known for so long, who yeah. I guess is running... What are her themes? Her has, She has a major theme going that she would be the first woman candidate, first woman president, and seems to think that that's something that would excite people a lot. But question whether people are getting excited the way they're supposed to or what she could do now to make that work or whether she ought to abandon that. But um, I think she's rather pushing that and something that's going on as a kind of counterpoint to that is um, some people are trying to raise questions about how she uh, responded when her husband, Bill Clinton, yeah, got yeah, into yeah. some gender-based troubles and whether that's something that could be brought up today. And I thought that that interfaced interestingly with what's going on with Bill Cosby, with some of the rape on campus issues that have been in the news a lot lately, and with the attacks that were going on in uh, New Year's Eve around uh, Cologne, Germany, and elsewhere. So some of the, the oh fears God. of... Uh, uh, sort of men uh, and their violence against women uh, uh, interfacing too? oddly with Bill Clinton's past and how that's a problem for Clinton, Hillary Clinton, as she tries to present herself as especially exciting because she would be the first woman president. That's a very provocative thesis, and I must say. Uh, I was going to say, are you not painting with too broad a brush? I, I think you may be. Bill Cosby, Bill Clinton, Cologne attacks, you know, uh, and... Uh, Hillary's uh, behavior uh, during the time when, you know, was she involved in uh, helping to cover it up and stuff like that? Does that discredit her in her capacity to authentically represent some claim about mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, historical significance of having become the first woman president? So I'm, I'm thinking an analogy. I'm thinking an analogy with Barack Hussein Obama, who uh, became the first African-American president. And I'm thinking about his battle for credibility he, too, would have been challenged along these dimensions. How black is he? Is he really black? OK, his father is Kenyan. Okay. He's not an American. His mother is an American. She's white. He's not a descendant of the African-American slaves in the classical sense of the term. He has to earn his blackness. OK, and so he does do so. You could say he's community organizer. He becomes culturally black. He marries uh, Michelle uh, uh -huh. and becomes blacker and so doing and so on. You might also say there by analogy that Hillary Clinton has to, as it were, earn her spurs to represent women and that she somehow hasn't done so to the extent that she's complicit in, you know, covering up her husband thing. I think it's awful, ugly, awful, awful, ugly. Now, then to go from there to Bill Cosby, what a leap, okay? And then to go from there to Cologne, what another leap. So, and it's a little bit like if the Black Lives Matter people overreach by saying everything is race, Maybe mm -hmm. you're overreaching here a little bit by saying everything is the same kind of gendered violence, sexual exploitation, whatever. Surely these cases are different. Cosby and Clinton? Well, Come on, that's not fair, two, is it? Two things I'd like to say <laughs> that, about that. And one is that I don't think Barack Obama may personally presented himself as, you should be for me because I'd be the first black president. Other people did say that and perceive it and get excited <laughs> about it. But I don't think he forefronted that as his theme, the way she is so much asking to be voted How do you because think he beat her in South Carolina? How do you think uh, Bill Clinton ended up with this uh, blemish for having compared Barack Obama to Jesse Jackson in South Carolina? Oh, well, he it's precisely in because... He was playing or having played on, on his behalf. I'm not sure the distinction uh -huh. is really worth very much. The race card. I mean, come on. <laughs> Did Barack Obama personally present himself, vote for me because I'm black? Or do people look at him and think, I want to be for him because it excites me to think of the first black president. I think that's different and that Hillary Clinton is doing more and is, after all these years, presenting herself as 
we should be excited. Why should we care about her as the candidate? They're resting, I think, her campaign is resting to more than Barack Obama did on the idea that she'd be a first and that we should be excited about that well, and that she's actually be. losing that excitement. I too. have to push back, and she would be a first and we should be excited, more excited, I would say, than an African-American. I would, say, I, say I would say it's a deeper and more profound rupture with the order of things Is it? to have a woman become the chief executive, the commander of the military, the determiner of the country's fate. Uh, than an African-American. Yes, I do. I mean, what are these identity things based on? I mean, I think the African-Americanness of Barack Obama is to a certain degree constructed. It's virtual. It's an idea as much as it is some kind of organic thing. I think the <laughs> biological determinism of gender is a very much heavier rupture in human relations than is uh, the color of race. And as I say, Obama's, Obama's thing is constructed. It's invented to a certain degree. As Bill Clinton said, it's a fantasy. It's an idea. He's the virtual black president. He is, as you said, everyone's idea of a black president. So I would, you know, just, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I can really defend this position. It's really a gut kind of feel. I'm just feeling a woman, a woman, Commanding the military? Wow, that just sounds like well, over-the-top revolutionary that's, to me. That's, I've heard that all my life, the idea of maybe a woman can't do it, doesn't have what it takes to be the leader of the military, to be the commander-in-chief, and so forth. But I didn't but, say that. Hmm? I, I didn't suggest that a woman doesn't have what it takes. I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm just saying that I've heard that okay. from the culture, not from you. Yes. You, know, you didn't say it. But um, when you're going to have that first person, if the person is going to get an added boost out of that firstness, it seems to me that uh, if that's what's being presented to us as an argument why we should vote for this person, if it's presented, and, I, and I'm arguing that she is presenting that, then we should analyze whether we like that idea of that particular representative of that group. Being first. <laughs> okay. And I would say that, and to the extent that she's relying on young women to get excited about her deploying Lena Dunham and other celebrities who are trying to enthuse us, not because of her policies or her individual capacities, but simply because she's a woman, because she would be that first. I think to the extent that we're being asked to do that, um, we're entitled to look more closely at that and at the very least to look back at what happened in the 1990s when Bill Clinton was involved with uh, having a sexual relationship with someone who worked in his workplace, his subordinate um, was accused of sexually harassing another woman at his workplace, Paula Jones. And obviously there are these other uh, allegations about him, but they are the very things that uh, women and feminists in, in recent years have put a lot of effort okay. into making more uh, visible in our culture as something we should be concerned about. I think that there is a complicated, unpleasant history about that dating back to the 90s in a continual relationship that she was in and that she was involved in. I've heard you out, and i got to push back, okay? I've heard you out. Let me get, So give me a minute. So to me, what this is like, I'm doing analogies between Clinton in 2016 and Obama in 2008. This is like Jeremiah Wright. In other words, Obama wants to run as the first black president. I mean, he's not saying it out loud because he can't, but it's all implicit in how he's running. And one line of attack on him is to discredit him by going to the root. Oh, you say you're black, huh? Well, let me go to that black church that you used to go to. Let me see what that black minister sounds like when you put him in front of the TV camera. Oh, he's black, is he? And thereby discrediting him because just look at how outrageous he is. So by analogy, what I'm saying in counterpoint to you, because I think you're doing a grave disservice to Hillary Clinton by trying to define her in these terms, is that here is this woman who is uh, the most accomplished Democratic politician alive today. Mm -hmm. That's who she is. She's the leader of her party, not by virtue of having been elected president, but by virtue of having served at the top of American government for three decades. She is a profoundly accomplished person. You can carp about her record, Secretary of State, Benghazi, I'm sure there will be arguments, okay? I'm not her defense attorney, but I'm just saying, a former U.S. senator, she was married to the President of the United States. She had major significant effect on U.S. policy for decades, okay? Now, 
Yes, there is this thing that you're talking about, and we could argue about it. I'm not inclined to disagree with you very much, except I don't accept the Bill Cosby analogy. But, but there is this thing. I agree with you that it's a thing. But in the context of the scope of it, don't define her by that. Likewise, Obama did go to that church, and he did sit there for however many years, but it would be very, very unfair to try to define him there. Okay, so what do you think about that? That's my counter. I think, number one, <laughs> I, I, I've read Obama's book, I, and Obama's religion is a very interesting topic to me. I think he tried to be successful within his community activism, and the church was part of that. He had to work through that. He was told, I don't think he was personally religious, but he was told that he needed to have that as part of what he did. And he sat there and listened to a certain kind of preaching. He was passively there in the audience. He was a member of the group. He was inspired by that. But that wasn't him speaking. I think that when Hillary, and it, remember, this was in the 1990s. This was so shortly after Clarence Thomas had been the, at the center of this vortex about sexual harassment that we were all supposed to learn. Uh, the men, You just don't get it. I'm sure you remember all of that around uh, Clarence Thomas. And everyone was supposed to get up to speed and learn the seriousness of the inequality in the workplace that is caused by men viewing women in the workplace as their sexual uh, choice, uh, toys, choice of uh, partners and so on, and using their superior power uh, toward women in the workplace. That was something that was vividly portrayed and you were regarded as, you know, retrograde and, and, uh, and sexist, if you didn't get that back at the time of Clarence Thomas's confirmation, it was only a few years after that that a strikingly similar thing happened with respect to Bill Clinton. That actually was much worse than what Clarence Thomas was ever accused of. And suddenly all of what was learned was forgotten for the sake of Democratic well, Party politics. Hold on, and Okay. And Hillary Clinton was involved in deceiving and covering for him. To me, there are some feminist crimes, misdeeds that put her in a different position with respect to women. It's not just sitting there listening to a preacher. It's being centrally involved with, uh, with facilitating, with, um, uh, supporting a person who was doing something that was antithetical to what the women's movement had built very strongly toward achieving earlier in that and, and inappropriately, I think, on the back of Clarence Thomas. And then it was all cast aside for the sake of uh, covering for Bill Clinton. She was involved in that. And to me, that uh, diminishes okay. her. As I have to, I have to I, this is my little rebuttal for what it's worth. Uh, I feel your passion and you are a woman. I cannot tell you how to feel about this and I can't know how you feel about it. Uh, I think the Clarence Thomas comparison is also outrageous. I think it's very unfair to Clarence Thomas. I mean, Bill Clinton did prey on an intern in the office. I mean, much worse. come on, if I had a love affair with a 22-year-old or 24-year-old graduate student, what would that be? That would be me, Professor Lowry, preying on the 24-year-old graduate student. There wouldn't be any two or three ways of interpreting that, okay? So I'm not, like I said earlier, I'm with you the whole... Clarence Thomas, as far as I'm concerned, that was a he said, she said situation. As far as I'm, this is not speaking to the larger issue of women in the workplace and so forth and so on. Maybe Thomas tried to hit on Anita Hill when she was working for him and uh, spoke to her inappropriately. Maybe he didn't. He denies that he did. As far as I was concerned, the hearings didn't resolve that question. And I thought it was a travesty what happened to Clarence Thomas because it was a political witch hunt because they didn't like his views. That was that was about. It was an open a campaign to try to destroy him, of which those hearings were a complicated political part. But we would have a long, dis presumably we'd have a long disagreement with that. But I don't disagree that Bill Clinton behaved profoundly and appropriately abusing his power and that he's Hillary Rodham Clinton's husband. That's true. What I'm saying is that is not disqualifying her being president of the United States. And I'm saying that I think it's very unfair to her, very unfair to her, I mean, I don't know what it's like to be married to somebody. She was involved who's, in covering for him. She's married to someone who's not faithful to her. Why don't we give her a, a break here for a moment? Don't make her into a cartoon character. She's a human being. No, I'm that that her breach her is very profound. She, she gets beyond it somehow. She gets beyond it. They stay together. Doesn't oh, that Oh, I don't buy that at all. I <laughs> absolutely do not buy the idea. She, she doesn't get any credit. Me. They don't and get any credit for living through that. If You're she just could forgive him, him forever for his for his ill. Uh, uh, no, I'm holding oh, two things. Number one, I hold her responsible for what she did, and number two, I don't particularly want Bill Clinton back. And I don't think well, 
just on the fact that he's already had two terms as president, I don't think he belongs back in the White House. That's a separate issue. But I think given what happened, this is not what we need as the first female president. Or it's at least not a good issue to forefront, which is what I'm mainly talking well, about. Well, it needn't be at the forefront if we would talk about all the other issues that matter, like the economy, what to do about ISIS, uh, what about the partisan breach in American politics and so forth and so on. But instead, we're talking about Bill uh, Clinton's sexual peccadillos as it presumptively disqualifies his wife from being able to take credit for being the first uh, woman. And we have agreed to disagree. So should we talk about something no, no, else? I, I want to clear. I need to clarify something. It's right. not his sexual peccadillos. It is the equality of women in the workplace. When you have sexual harassment in the workplace, it's a form of sex discrimination. I That's accept, inequality in the workplace. If feminists don't care about that, if we don't see that as an important issue, not a trivial thing to be pushed, oh, why are we distracted by someone's sexual life? That's it's not, not her sexual of, life. When that she's is the, the candidate, of feminism. and she's the candidate. It's not her sexual life. Good she job. She was involved in. S suppose it were the other way around. Suppose he were the candidate and she had had the affair. And a, and a political opponent was trying to discredit him because he stood with a woman who, who had an extramarital affair. That would be the slimiest kind of politics. I, I think you're you're failing to. I, I know that you know what I'm saying, and you're <laughs> packaging it. You're packaging what happened as if it was sexuality and someone having their pleasure on the side beyond what we what we don't have to look at. Like why don't we just leave people to their private life? The personal is political, and sexual harassment in the workplace is an equality issue for women. And women feminists have worked very hard over the years to have that cause to be taken seriously. That's what the Clarence Thomas, to the extent that it was anything other than a political uh, witch hunt, uh, that's what that was about. See this as genuinely being about the equality of women in the workplace. And to say, no, let's put it aside and call it a sexual peccadillo. Let's... and and. Uh, it is to sell out something that's core to feminism. And Hillary Clinton was involved in selling out something that was core to feminism when she was part of covering for Bill Clinton back in the 90s. Okay, I hold yeah. that against her, and I hold that against all the women who support her and who talk the talk of feminism and concern about female equality when it's not about the lot of the Democratic Party and then forget about it and subordinate it. It shows where people's values really are. I think that's immensely important, and I've thought that since the night for more than 20 years. Well, thank you very much, Ann Allhouse, because you have definitely spoken the last word on that. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I, guess, I guess I agree. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You beat me, you browbeat me into submission. That when you make the power observation and you say that about the equality claim and you say the abuse of authority and so forth, what can I say? He's guilty. She's complicit. You're not going to vote for her. I mean, you know, there you are. I probably will vote for her if she's on the ballot. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Let's talk about something else. <laughs> what, what else is on your mind? How are you feeling about Black Lives Matter? Have they, uh, do they draw forth a similar venom? from you and your uh, identification of their inconsistencies and the moral no, inadequacy say, of their claims? What I want to say about Black Lives Matter is it seems to me that this issue was very well developed earlier in 2015 and with a lot of focus on the idea that there should be specific attention to discrimination against black people and the facile and response to all lives matter was rejected and you were supposed to understand let's have a specific focus on the problem of especially with respect to the police, uh, black people. And candidates were, you know, their feet were held to the fire over this. Earlier in 2015, where did it go? Why aren't we talking about that now? What has something changed in the campaign as the candidates are being asked questions and as they're presenting issues, that issue got eclipsed. It dropped out. How did that happen? Why did that happen? Well, okay. Was there not? That. Hold on. We're speaking in the aftermath of the Democratic debate the day after uh, the Democrats uh, met and debated on January 17th <coughs> in uh, South Carolina. And uh, uh, that's, this question did come up. I can't remember uh, which of the uh, journalists asked it, 
but they were basically asked to respond to uh, whether and in what ways the Black Lives Matter movement uh, was uh, an important part of the campaign. And I thought they did respond vigorously, all three of them, O'Malley, Clinton, and Sanders, in uh, stipulating that uh, they thought that uh, police uh, behavior was uh, off the reservation in some respects and need to be brought under control. And in fact, I think I heard them, I believe all three of them, affirm that there should be automatic federal investigation of any local incident in which right. a person dies in police custody. I thought that was an extraordinary thing to have been said. The presumption that local authorities are unable to adjudicate uh, incidents of this kind that happen. Uh, I, I thought it was a terrible idea, to be honest with you. Uh, and uh, they're still genuflecting. So uh, quite the contrary. I, I think the Black Lives Matter people have won a kind of iconic status within the democratic constellation of, uh, of belief, mystical almost, mm -hmm. and in embodying the touchstone. It's a little bit like you would want today being Martin Luther King's day to say something as all of them will say in their platitudes about Martin Luther King. And, you know, I think I saw Hillary Clinton already today saying that uh, her father or something, Martin Luther King or something. And I thought, oh, how platitudinous. Uh, but likewise, the Black Lives Matter have become this iconic thing. And the thing that I find interesting about it is uh, not the obvious point that police do things and these incidents happen. And uh, even that you can racialize them, although I object to the easy and unreflective racialization of them. If I'm li listening to PBS and on the news hour and someone tells me that a white police officer did something, I'm just wanting to know why they're using the adjective white. Why are they calling this police officer white as they report the fact that the police officer had an encounter with a suspect and the suspect ended up dead? I think it's very terrible journalism. But more broadly, I'm saying Black Lives Matter have become this kind of iconic touchstone, and yet they have a, such a one-dimensional view about what it is to value black lives. So, yeah, so, you're so black the, the, the black lives that are being shot down on the street by other black people are actual black lives. You can't say black lives matter and have nothing to say about them. The black lives that are being failed by the massive educational system. And no, I'm not trivializing something. If you tell me the black lives that are being failed by child protective services from the disorder of uh, parental child relationships and the irresponsibility of people and these poor abandoned kids, including some of them like Laquan McDonald, who was a victim of a police shooting. If you read the Chicago Tribune's. A uh, journalistic biography of Laquan McDonald, it'll break your heart. He was born in foster care. His mother was 14 years old or something like that when he was born. She was a foster child. He's a second generation ward of the state. Okay, so if, you, if black lives really mattered, people would be talking about that. So it's a shtick. That's so the Yiddish I, word, the Yiddish word, S-H-T-I-C-K. Yeah. It's a shtick. So I know. Uh, when, and, and, and I'm just wondering how it gets to be the 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 place where the Democratic candidates genuflect. It just goes to show you, I'm sorry to go on, Anne, but I feel about this the same way you feel about yeah. Bill Clinton. It goes on to, to show how cheap black lives actually are at the end of the day to the Democrats, to wit. Right, yeah. They're willing to allow an engagement with the substantive root of the diminution of black life to go unspoken while they genuflect at totems Right. Which are people with megaphones on street corners yelling about incidents that are one in a million. These incidents are one in a million. The everyday grinding depredation of black lives has no register, is nowhere articulated in the rhetoric of this movement. That's so, the thing that astounds me. Now, <coughs> Thank I you thought for you were going go to <coughs> disagree with me that the issue has been eclipsed. But what I hear you saying is the issue was never really uneclipsed in the first place. There was barely anything there. Any There's much more to what should be talked about than the little bit that got exposed in Black Lives Matter. So I was going in the direction of saying I thought Black Lives Matter was a fairly substantial uh, concern in the current campaign. And I believe that that got eclipsed. What I want to say is it got eclipsed after the San Bernardino massacre. I think oh. that was a rift. But oh. what I hear you saying is 
Black Lives Matter was never even close to being close to enough. And it should have been much more. And I'm, I, 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 that's fine. I agree with that. It should have been much more. But what I want to say is that the foothold that it got, it lost. Well, do you agree with this, that the Baltimores and the Fergusons of the world and the Detroits and the St. Louises and the uh, Oaklands and the South Central L.A.s and the Houstons uh, and the Chicago's of this world and the Milwaukee's uh, and the East St. Louis's and the Camden's uh, and et cetera, okay? Uh, the New Orleans's of this world. I'm talking about these communities. Mm -hmm. They've been governed by Democrats and subject to great society uh, initiative for a half century. The first black elected officials emerged as the municipal executives of these jurisdictions. They have been the site of one after another, after another, after another, after another, after another, another multi-billion dollar initiative to try to foster this or that or the other. Okay. Now, if you were serious about Black Lives Mattering here in the 21st century, where we're a half century on from all of the tumult of the civil rights movement, and you looked around and you saw failing schools, you saw jails that were overflowing with people who actually broke the law. Mm -hmm. It's not as if they're sending the vans up and down the street and just rounding up people at, at random. Courts that are overflowing. Public hospital waiting rooms that are jammed to the max. Family disorganization. Social workers' cases that would make your hair stand on end. Thousands upon tens of thousands of them. Okay, If you really thought that Black Lives Matter it would have to engage in a reflexive and critical examination of the very foundation of social policy in this country over the last half century as it has borne on the lives of black and poor people. That would be to the discredit of the Democratic Party in a profound way. They so haven't even begun to recognize the problem, let alone promote any kind of critical intellectual resource to deal with it. This is why I say at the end of the day, they show how cheap black lives actually are. Let me give you an, an analogy. Mm -hmm. Hispanic lives matter more than black lives to the Democrats. Right, well, okay? That's something because I they're know. prepared to reshape the United States of America on behalf of their con Hispanic constituents. So They are throwing the black people bones when they genuflect to a bunch of 22-year-old uh, people with, a, with a, a social media account and a hashtag. And they let that drive the politics of race when the Democratic Party's politics of race ought to be about how come our cities look like they are after 50 years of what we've been trying to do for them. Um, that's, that's the dis devaluation of black life, the absence of a critical political right. reflection by the people who are responsible for the basket cases that we've got I, in our cities. I agree with everything that you said. I thought that was... So that's a criticism that there's much more that should be in the campaign. I guess um, so. <laughs> but, and there used to be more. I was going to say just that there used to be more. We don't even have that. You're saying there should be much more. I agree with you about that. And I also want to focus on the way in which the racial politics of the current campaign hasn't been about black people, especially after Black Lives Matter is not even above. Well, maybe it's getting a little genuflection, as you put it now, uh, but it's mostly about, I think, what I see the most is criticizing Donald Trump and some others for the things they want to do with respect to immigration, problems with, uh, and, the, and the race has to do with Hispanic people, and also, if you want to call it race, Muslims, that's, I don't know, you want to say ethnicity, race? Yeah, I, I take your for point. A frame I, that. I, I, but I to the extent that, that there's, there's a charge of bigotry, of course, that's used politically. Uh, there's a lot of a swirl around Donald Trump that he's... Uh, a bigot, right? But it's not about black people at all. It's about Hispanics and Muslims, and it's around this immigration issue. It's a flurry of, uh, I think, a kind of propaganda around uh, around the immigration issue. That's where the racial politics of the campaign is right now. Uh, all of what you could say about black people, I'm not hearing it. I'm not seeing that. Maybe there's a little bit. Or if someone says, can you say black lives matter? They'll say black lives matter. But that's what they, they do. Move on. And then they move on. Yeah. So the racial politics is around Hispanics and Muslims. Okay, so you do not think Donald Trump is a racist. You want to defend him against that charge? 
I think he wants to control the borders. And that lets the other side say, oh, that's racist. Don't think that. And so there can't be, what troubles me is that there can't be as a serious discussion about immigration issues because people are afraid of being called racist. People are afraid of being called a bigot. And I think one of the things that people like about Donald Trump, those who like him, is that he's going ahead and saying it, and it's creating a kind of inoculation <laughs> against something that people have feared so much, which is being called a bigot. It's just too effective to call people bigots, and a lot of people are very intimidated and silenced and don't even want to talk about it okay, okay, because so they don't want to be called that. So I think part of his popularity is he goes there, he says it, he takes the hit, and it still works for him. So that's a, a kind of a liberating uh, change in the discourse. I agree with that. I, I was going to say that um, take, I want to give a concrete example. I, I agree with your general theory about Donald Trump, that he's succeeding not because he's, uh, uh, you know, dog whistling racist messages to a mm -hmm. racist uh uh, constituency, but rather because he is going where no person has gone before and people feel a certain liberated and liberating effect from that because he's raising legitimate questions. Uh, and I was going to go a step further. Uh, and I wanted to give uh, two examples about where I think Donald Trump is, is interesting and not necessarily racist for what he's saying, although he will be called so. One is when he says of the, the San Bernardino shooters, who else knew? What about their network, their friends, their neighbors, the people who are saying, how could they have amassed mm -hmm. such a thing and nobody knew? Those people should have told. Now, of course, we don't know what they knew. I suppose investigations can find out something about that. But to the normal person sitting on their couch watching television, to me, that's an idea that's going to appeal to them. They're going to say, yeah, you know, that might be right. And they have to tell. They have to, So you see where that goes. That goes into a witch hunt kind of space where co-religionists who are also Muslims go to the same mosque or whatever are now implicated in the crazed acts of one of their members and are implicitly being pressured to tell what they know, you know, to monitor each other. It's not a nice space to go to, but I think, you know, it's it's a little bit like, I don't know what, racial profiling or something where you... Everybody racially profiles on a dark street at three o'clock in the morning, which is to say they look at who's walking toward them and they react accordingly. They don't react the same way to old white ladies as they do to young men who have a hooded sweatshirt on. And, and you don't ever want to acknowledge that, but somehow it's compelling. And likewise, here it's compelling. That, that was, that was uh, one of the things of his that I wanted to point to. Um, Remember, he did. There was a case of at least one person in the neighborhood who had been in their garage and saw weapons around on the floor. Oh, and wasn't that person accused oh, was, of something? Or? Wasn't there one? And I, I don't want to just spout things I'm not sure yeah. of, but I think there was at least one person I who think said been that was new. That, not that they went looking or nosing into it, but they, they but knew they something, yeah. but they didn't want to report it because they were afraid of being considered oh, I see, yeah. uh, racist or anti-Muslim. And so they wanted to be inclusive. And so that caused them to overlook or to say, and, and to be just afraid of being accused of being a bigot. In any case, he's willing to go into that territory where other people aren't willing to go. And I don't think that makes him a racist because I think somehow I would actually speculate about that myself if I were thinking of it. The other thing that he says that I think is, he says, you either have a country or you don't. I, I find that to be a very compelling statement. Right. I really do. If you don't control your border, you don't have a country. I mean, duh, really. And, <laughs> and, 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 and it exposes this idea that the composition of the polity is at stake, that that's the thing that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it legitimates thinking about it in that way, mm -hmm. which is kind of tacitly taboo, that we would ever want to think we are the United States of America and have somehow a corporate existence and interest in self-preservation and the management of our own composition that would then raise questions about, well, who do we want to be in our polity, which would then cause us to say, oh, yeah, that's why we have a border, which then leads us to building a fence. The fence thing, very profoundly symbolic. So is a fence racist? I don't see how a fence is racist. It may be bad policy, may be the wrong thing to do, but I don't see how it's racist. I don't see how the assertion of national integrity is racist. Neither do I see how the assertion 
that if you are a responsible member of our community and you do know about people among you who are doing things that are harmful, then you should report them. I don't think that that's a racist thing to say either. So there you are. That doesn't mean I'm a Donald Trump supporter, but you know, I think you're a kind of a Donald Trump supporter. You, 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 you guy, I am a Donald so Trump. Here's a question that I have. <laughs> that there, uh, there's kind of an idea about Donald Trump that it's uneducated people. It's sort of dumb people who. I thought uh, that's what the polls were showing. I thought the polls were showing that. Yeah. Uh, actually, there's some detail to that, but here's my question. Okay. Also, people don't necessarily say what they're really going to do in the polls, but okay. uh, question whether there are a lot of people who um, actually like Donald Trump but don't talk about it, don't want to say it because uh, they don't want to. They're afraid of looking like a racist, or they're afraid of looking like a bigot, and also because the idea has been put out there that it's for dumb people, it's for uneducated people, you don't want to be one of those. So there's an effort by his opponents to present him as sort of toxic, or to say that you were for him would be to confess something you certainly wouldn't want to say about yourself. But he himself is about going ahead and saying things, and, and it works. So in, in some ways, I feel like there's like a floodgate or a cascade that could occur, where at some point people realize... Yes, we can say it too. We're for Donald Trump and that there could be this breakthrough where a whole lot of people you wouldn't expect would suddenly start saying that they were for and Donald Trump. So we ought to get busy. To start Come that. on, there's an academic paper to be written here. It could go in a political science journal. I can see it all now. We would do web-based surveys. We'd have to get started immediately. Mm -hmm. But the idea would be to catch this wave because I agree with you about this. You can already mm -hmm. see it, the precursors of it, as the journalists are beginning to reposition and pre-position themselves by mm -hmm. somehow walking back earlier statements about the incredulity and the impossibility and the, oh, it can never happen. Mm -hmm. they, and they're laying down these kind of retreat markers as they try to get themselves out of it. And, 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 and I, I, I think there would be various groups to study. You know, you, there'd be your typical voters, there'd be your party operatives. I don't know about the people who are in these organizations who are making decisions about committing to candidates, but they also must have a story. There'd be your journalists that you talk about and the academics and so on. So the rehabilitation of Donald Trump, because I think it's a fair prediction that should he actually prevail and become the nominee, he will not be regarded with the same degree of dismissive contempt by the uh, commentariat uh, as he is today. There will, he, he will not be Barry Goldwater. He will not be, I don't think he will be uh, George McGovern. I'm looking on the other side, 1972, you know, uh, maybe too far to the left. Uh, I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I think I should, uh, I should stop talking. Otherwise, I'll I think you're put my foot in it. By the possibility of <laughs> Trump. I'm certainly amused by it. I'm excited and amused by the possibility. That's so see, <laughs> some, there's this uh, fermentation going on. There's a loosening up, a breaking up of something that had been frozen that yeah. could, that's very dramatic that's happening, I think. Yeah. And people are trying to understand it, but you're trying to understand everybody's minds. These sort of uh, things are happening individually in people's minds, and he's having an effect, and he's extremely gifted in whatever the thing he is doing is. And, you know, the pundits are being caught so flat-footed. I mean, right now I watch the Sunday shows to see people like George Will just being yeah, simply flummoxed. He's in trouble. <laughs> George it's, Will it's is in trouble. It's actually very entertaining. In, in how these people couldn't take the man seriously at all. And he's doing something quite extraordinary. And I don't think, I think we'll have to look back to understand what it really has been, what it really is right now. I guess that's right, too. <laughs> do you want to broach another subject or do you want to call it a day? Up to you. Um, I think, oh, I want to talk just briefly. Yeah. New, let's talk about New York. Oh, and, New York, New York. Oh, yes, Ted Cruz. Uh, uh, Ted and Cruz Donald Trump. New York values. New York values, <laughs> yeah. With something prepared, of course, he's hyper prepared. He's been a Supreme Court advocate. He delivers things so precisely. He's yes. really good at Ted Cruz. So he came prepared to get Donald Trump by saying Donald Trump represents New York values. Yes. Whatever that meant, some people think he meant like uh, social liberal things, which I agree with. So it wouldn't be bad for me. But, uh, uh, you know, to get him with the 
That's undercut. what I thought he meant. He, he meant abortion and gay marriage and stuff like that. Some people think he meant it was a dog whistle anti-Semitism. Yeah, well, it's New York, so it's going to be hard to separate the one from the other. But so, uh, <laughs> but, so he was all planned with that. And Donald Trump just spontaneously came out with this peon to New York, this in praise of New York that was very memorable, talking about 9-11 and the smell of death. It and was his was best terrible. moment of the debate, I think we can agree, was and, it not? And he didn't have that plan. That was just speaking from the heart. That yeah. was... Um, and so then the idea that, you know, people actually love New York or they can remember the love they once had on 9-11. And then it's, there's also Bernie Sanders with, I mean, he's from Vermont, but he has a very heavy New York accent. So you have these two. So New that's York not a Jewish thing when you say he has a New York accent. That's not what you mean. I think that's a New York accent, isn't it? Okay. Or is it, uh, uh, I, I think it's. No, a, I don't know. I don't know if the accent would be different if he were Irish or Italian uh, or black coming out of New York, but I suspect it would. He's got a very. Um, well, Larry David very famously. Yeah, parodies <laughs> him. Yes, indeed. So there's a very New York quality to him. Uh, maybe there is. And it's I, probably I, yeah, being Jewish, which he is. But, uh, but anyway, I, I just think you've got these two characters ascendant in their parties. Seemingly speaking, very spontaneously, being different, seeming like a, well, I don't know if you want to call it a breath of fresh air. It's a pretty weird and elderly breath of fresh air. But the, the two men from New York, particularly Trump with his pro-New York, uh, uh, New York values flip, uh, I think it's very interesting that America seems to be having a New York moment or that America could love New York. Yeah, well, Trump's story is interesting because uh, his dad is a real estate guy in the outer boroughs, you know, owning apartment <laughs> buildings in uh, Brooklyn and Queens, I think. And uh, Trump ends up breaking And told him, room. don't go to Manhattan. Yeah, Where don't go. That? That's where the big boys play. They'll stomp on you. They're giants over there. And Trump ends up uh, towering now over mm -hmm. his uh, uh, New York competitors as a global, mag uh, you know, guy who's uh, astride the whole thing. And he's running for president and he's winning. In fact, mm -hmm. listen to him tell you he's ahead in all the polls. He knows he always knows on any given day by exactly how much he's ahead in the latest polls. <laughs> yeah. I like that about Donald Trump. Yeah. And I must say that in his uh, off the cuff kind of interviews that he's been giving on these Sunday shows to people uh, like uh, uh, George Stephanopoulos and uh, mm -hmm. whatnot, he's pretty impressive. I mean, he, he's he's no dummy. He's not. They say he doesn't have the experience. Maybe he doesn't have the temperament. But I don't think you can say that he doesn't have the heft to, to do the job, that he's not that he's in the way that unfortunately Ben Carson is, you know, I don't I hate to pile on. I kind of have a soft place in my heart for Ben Carson. I like Ben Carson at some level. Everyone um, likes him. Huh? Everyone likes him. Yeah, everyone likes him. But it's pretty clear that he's not fit to be president of the United States. I don't think you can say that about Donald Trump. <laughs> and I'm, you know, so maybe I'm prepositioning myself. Maybe I'm now moving Glenn Lowry a little bit in the space that can get onto the. I think, you know, if you, you know, want to come out as a Trump supporter, you could you could uh, ride the early crest of the wave. Uh, you could be on that cascade. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like New York City. I have, I'll, I'll confess that to you. I'm, I'm not a New Yorker. I'm from Chicago, the second city or the uh -huh. third city or whatever. But, uh, but uh, I have never failed to be a, an admirer of the vitality and the kind of, you know, just global significance of stuff that goes on in New York City. It's uh -huh. a place I like to go to. Um, so, okay, and maybe, maybe that's it for this afternoon. I can't drag I it out of you. Maybe, maybe next time you'll want to. Uh, so what did we disagree about? We disagreed about uh, Hillary Clinton's entailment and her husband's uh, power moves in the office that were in violation of sexual equality, and she's complicit in that. And I want to kind of give her a pass, and you don't. Uh, we, did we agree about Black Lives Matter? Where well, I was saying yes. it's not broad enough. That's what I we agreed. Not, Indeed, no. we agreed. It wasn't, we both had the view that it. You uh, might disagree with me about whether an, something that was more prominent as an issue became eclipsed at the point in time when the San Bernardino massacres happened. Oh, whether that timeline is kind correct. of pushed them off the uh, and agenda I think it a little bit. Do, I think it has something to do with Trump's uh, continued ascendancy in that. San Bernardino made such an impact on people, even with just two people on one day in one place. 
how that could shift all of American politics, but it made people much more uh, security conscious and the whole uh, maybe attack on the police and so forth wasn't as uh, workable or, or maybe uh, there was reason to stop paying attention to that because people became uh, make us safe, make us secure, and all of the candidates shifted to speaking that way. Well, you know, this is an issue that we didn't discuss and we were kind of signing off. It's a whole other thing. It's the attack on the police. Because mm -hmm. I'm also against the spirit of the times as embodied by Black Lives Matter on that. I, I really don't like this move of demonization of the police. I don't think the police are the problem. I, I grant that these incidents occur and they must be reacted to, but I think defining the problem in terms of the police, mm -hmm. not that they cannot be reformed. We can talk about that. I think everything that's being talked about is operating around the margins. You know, it's not going to be some fundamental transformation, whether it's body cameras or more community policing or whatever. It's around the margins because I think you've got a crime issue that's going on down underneath. But, but I just think the... Uh, Production of order is a collaborative enterprise, and it requires the cooperation of the community. And the, you know, the idea that every time a cop stops me, I'm going to pull out my phone and record the incident, that I'm going to have my, uh, my backup, uh, you know, what are you stopping for me? I get to, you know, you know, that I'm going to go by the letter and everything. I'm not going to pay respect to the cop. I can't actually submit to his authority. Submission to his authority is complicity in some kind of racial... This is a very bad idea in a place where there's a high crime rate and where cops actually have to stop people and have to deal with the with the consequences of their behavior. This is not what you want. So I think, you know, yeah. I, I'm just now I'm just preaching because I'm not giving you a fair chance to respond. But I, I and maybe we agree, but I, I just have a feeling that there is something at stake in how one defines uh, the narrative around policing that is off, that is a little bit off in the Black Lives Matter voice. Uh, and I, I, you know, I want to push back here. I mean, if the cops are actually keeping guns from ending up shooting people, they're saving black lives. They, they, they are part of the solution to Black Lives Mattering uh, at some level, not only stopping the very few incidents where they are abusive, but uh, fostering the very many constructive incidents where they're actually a part of preventing the loss of black life. I mean, why, why wouldn't that be a part of the equation? I do worry about these stop and frisk kinds of things <coughs> that where they do find illegal guns. You have a uh, heavy gun control regulation and people who are in a place where they want to defend themselves and they will have a gun. Uh, now it's they're committing to be crime. Illegal. Now yeah, a, a serious crime is used and people who get arrested like that when they're reacting to their environment and trying to defend themselves. I think that, gets us into some deep uh, gun control, what should the gun regulation be, and who's getting set up by that kind of regulation. You know, I never thought of that, Anne. I never thought of this. I ne First of all, I never thought about the Second Amendment rights being critically important to inner city black people who may be in high crime areas, just how I'm translating what you just said. Uh, yeah. and, and that because if they're in a liberal area where there's heavy gun control, they will have to break a serious law in order to be able to purchase a weapon. Exactly. And so can you how badly a... they feel they need the weapon, that they're willing to break that law and expose themselves to that risk in order to defend themselves in that way. Then when you pile stop and frisk on top of that yeah. and you end up catching them and sending them to prison for three years for some stuff right. like this. Right. That's what happens. I never if thought of that. If you're going to have a, a program like stop and frisk, you're gonna, it's predictable that you will find people committing a crime, but it's the crime of trying to defend yourself. Arguably, there's a Second Amendment right there. I never thought of that. So where is the right to life? I mean, the right to life. The National Rifle Association in opposing stop and frisk because it delimits the effective ability of people to arm themselves uh, and whatnot. I guess they'd have to acknowledge that the laws are being broken in order well, to make this the, argument. The laws shouldn't be so severe. You shouldn't have regulations you don't want to see enforced. And then you pass these laws, maybe to get credit from gun opponents and to look good politically. And then you have that there on the books in a way that it can be used against people who are making rational and desperate, maybe desperate decisions, trying to protect themselves. This is the, this is the back alley abortion argument. Put that in quotes. Right, yeah, yeah. It's the same form of argument. You have this prohibition. It forces people to do things that are illegal. That ends up being more harmful to them. Mm -hmm. they, all they were trying to do was exercise a right. <laughs> That's basically That's what, what you're saying. Rights. That's what we need <laughs> So that they can't interpose those laws with respect to things that 
belong to the individual. I didn't know this about you, Anne. Are you a member of the National Rifle Association? No, I'm not a member of anything. <laughs> <laughs> Do you own a weapon, if I may ask? I am glad weapons are owned, and I think that whether people own them or not is not necessarily something that one ought to talk about. That's fair. Then, you... Speaking of privacy, I, yes. I don't... Uh, well, you're able to look into my house. Maybe I'm letting the world look at my house. You are letting them in. People may be taking very special note of, they may even enlarge the image and look at the titles of books on the show. Right, right. But I was going to tell you a story as you said this thing. I agree with you. It's personal. So uh, the story is I have a friend. His name is John Romer. He's an economist. And he and his wife own a ranch in New Mexico. And once I was at the Santa Fe Institute as a scholar, and mm -hmm. he invited me to his ranch. So the ranch is two hours drive from the Santa Fe in, uh, Institute through the most beautiful country that you ever want to imagine. And it's very isolated. And I get to this ranch after all of this driving off this road and that. And then there's a rented road that goes up the side of the uh, mountain up to where the actual ranch house is. He has to come in his vehicle and get me because my vehicle can't get up there. <coughs> and we're sitting out. And I realize that if somebody comes for you, there's no help. Right. The, the you know, you're, you're absolutely defenseless. You could call 911 until the cows come home. Mm -hmm. It'll be a day before anybody gets there and finds your body. So I asked the woman who lived there uh, whether or not she armed herself. Mm -hmm. uh, John and his wife Natasha only visit there in the summertime. Mm -hmm. But Natasha's sister is a year-round resident on this property. And she said, no. She said, if I had a gun, I would have to use it, wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. You know, and she was declaring herself unwilling to put herself in the position of having to kill someone, regardless of what the implication of that might be for her own safety. And I thought that that was such a profoundly, well, you know, spiritual kind of stance for a person to take. It's a little bit like vegetarianism or something. Yeah, but you um, might not want to advertise that. You might, be, you might be thinking, well, if it ever comes down to it, I am going to die in this situation. But uh, you might not want the whole world to know that. To know that you're there so they have an incentive. A, I'm completely undefended, and if you attack me, I'm going to surrender. You don't put a sign like that outside your house, do you? No, you do not. Uh, and, people who uh, have guns are protecting everybody else. That's another one of these arguments that Donald Trump and other people have been making that, again, strikes the common sense. If there had been two people in the room who had been armed, there might not have been 14 people dead. There might have only been four people dead or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or know, if, if it was not, with that. they might not have never started it in the first place if they thought they would be stopped immediately by other people. I mean, what are the soft targets? Don't be a soft target. Oh, Lord. So it's like there are two equilibria here. One maybe not be stable. The one is where everybody's armed, and then the other is where nobody is armed, and so no one feels the need to be armed. Yeah, that isn't going to happen. But something tells me that's the logical extension of the gun control argument. Are, uh, mucking, mucking around at the margins is not going to really change anything. You'd have to really significantly reduce the number of guns that were in circulation, which would mean buying back or confiscating people's guns. And while no one wants to say it, that basically is the argument. So it might be a better world if you could get there, but I don't know how you're going to get there. <clears throat> well, number one, we have a constitutional right. That's one of the first things that keeps you from that. getting there. <laughs> yeah. We usually don't take away rights. Uh, true. I mean, it's not an American thing. You know, I noticed that the State of the Union, Obama kept saying, it's not who we are. And it's in our DNA. And, you know, the guns are who we are, and it is in our DNA. You got you to gotta stay with it. This, to me, connects back to the idea of do you have a country and needing borders and defining the group that you are. The whole world isn't going to go with the American values. We've tried doing that. It isn't going to happen. The idea of defining a country and making the standards here what is our culture. And we could argue about what that is. But I think it's pretty obvious that the guns are a part of the culture and the effort to get rid of them is not who we are. They're in our DNA. All right, Anne, that's magnificent. You signed this <laughs> off beautifully. Have a good afternoon over there okay, in Madison, Wisconsin. Okay, cool. Bye. Bye-bye. Right.